Hey, good morning, Watermark. Again, my name is John, and this past week, my family and I were on a road trip, and we stopped by this little, like, tourist trap souvenir shop. And I give the kids, I say, hey, you each have $10. So they scouted like mice. They go to try to find whatever they're looking for. Penny comes out, and she has a stuffed animal sloth. I didn't know they existed. I didn't know there was a big market for sloth stuffed animals. It, like, wrap around her arm. And she's like, Daddy, I'm going to name it Slow and Steady, A-N-N, Slow and Steady. I was like, that's incredible. Okay, great. What'd you get, Judd, our four-year-old? He brought, uh, you know, like little green army men. He brought these multicolored cowboy play set because he loves imaginary things. So he brings me that. Hill, our oldest, walks up to me. I was like, what'd you get, Hill? What are you going to get? We're there at the cash register. And he's like, he's like I-, I found this. I found this pocket knife. It's got a lock blade, and I'm like, that's good. That's a, that's, that's a good one. You got a good gift there. So we're checking it out, and the guy, he checks out the sloth, the cowboys, and then he gets to the knife, and he goes, hey, son, you better watch out. If you misuse that knife, this might happen. <laughs> Except he wasn't doing that. No joke. He was missing two digits. <laughs> and my son's like, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm like, take the knife, buddy. I got it from here. I'm like... What happened? I mean, you're a desk clerk at a souvenir shop. You sell a lot of knives or what? And he's like, well, me and my partner, we were chopping wood. And I set down the wedge on the block of wood. My partner was already in a full power swing. That's what he said. I don't know how. And boom. And I thought I knew what pain was until that day. Now I really know. And he's like looking through half of a hand at me. (laughs) I was like, oh, my goodness. And so I turned to Hill and I said, hey, you know what? You know that guy who lost his fingers because he, he misused a tool? I said, now, now you have a tool. And you need to use this in a good way. So when you, when you cut something, you have to cut away from you. Never, never pull it towards you. You've got to cut away. If you're, uh, you never point this at someone. You never run with it open. You always put it. That's a lock blade. You know, when you're done using it, you fold that up. You have a responsibility now because you have this tool, and you use it for good, and not like that axe-slinging souvenir shop guy. And he's like, yes, I understand. I I share that with you because today in 1 Corinthians 12, we see spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts are a lot like tools within a tool set. They can be used for a variety of purposes. They're they're, to be used for good and for building, never to be used for harm, never for yourself, but for the good of the body. That is what these spiritual gifts that are like tools to build up are for. And if you've trusted in Christ, if you're a believer and you've placed your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, then you need to know and be reminded again today that you have a spiritual gift. You have been given a spiritual gift, having trusted in Jesus by the Holy Spirit to now use for the building up of the body of Christ. It's not if you have a gift. The question isn't if you have a gift. The question is, are you using your gift? Are you using the spiritual gift that you've been given? So we're gonna be walking through 1 Corinthians 12, and here's your outline. So in 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul writes, and he says, I I tell you these things so that you might know how to live and operate in the household of God. He says, he calls it a household, that this church, this body of believers, it's a family unit living in a house, and as such, here's your outline, three things. One, you have a new owner. There is a new owner over your life, and he is a good owner. You also have a new tool with new power. So it is a tool with power, but the power is from the Holy Spirit. It's a new tool. That's your new spiritual gift with the power of the Holy Spirit. So new owner, new tool with new power. And thirdly, there is a new vibe in this household. Now, if you're 50 or older and you're like, vibe, what is is vibe? Lean over to a 20-year-old and ask them what vibe means. They'll tell you. But there is a new vibe in this household of God, and it's altogether different than we've walked in the darkness of the world. So new owner, new tools with new power, and new vibe. First, new owner. We were on this road trip, we stopped through a little Texas town. Laura was like, hey, I've got a Dairy Queen gift card. So we, we pull in, we stop there, we ordered blizzards. And I was like, hey, I need three small M&M blizzards. That's what the kids like. And they're like, uh, sure, we don't have any M&Ms. I'm like, what kind of Dairy Queen doesn't? All right, uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. It's like, great. Makes them, he hands them to me. He's got three, as if I can grab three blizzards. And, and there's ice cream dripping down the side of it. So I'm like, okay, all right. 
hey, we're going to need some napkins. And he goes, we don't got napkins. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> like, what's going on that you're, you're Dairy Queen? Like, you, by necessity, you have to have napkins. You serve ice cream to children. It might be against the law to not have napkins. And he's like, we don't, we don't got napkins, man. And Laura's like getting wet wipes and making sure it's good for the kids. And the kids are like, those workers are bad as we drive down. <laughs> and I was thinking the same thing, but we get a little further down the road. And I'm like, like, oh, this is a teachable moment. I was like, hey, kids, you know, we thought those workers were bad. They're not bad. They're actually really hard workers. They made the blizzards. Are you enjoying your blizzard? You liked it, didn't you? They did a good job. The problem was there's a bad manager. We didn't meet the manager. The bad manager didn't see the... the inventory of napkins going down and didn't order more napkins. He didn't order more M&Ms. Like, I don't even know what else they're out of, but it's not. It's the management's fault. And as it is with us, when we were under our former management, this is why restaurants say under new management, because people know, like, dude, their service is bad, their food is bad. So new management means something. And we also, when we were under our old management, we were given over to sin and darkness and death. We were hated and hating one another. It says in Titus, because we were under our old management. And now God's like, no, now you've got a new owner because of Jesus and everything's different. And people can see it and experience it because you have a new owner who's using you in good ways. As a recovering alcoholic, I was at my grandfather's house once when he passed and we were collecting things to remember him by. And as a drunk at the time, I grabbed a bottle opener. I was like, well, this, this is awesome because it's old, rusted, like vintage 1950s bottle opener, probably like old school Pabst Blue Ribbon or something. I was like, well, that'll be great at parties. Well, I still have that bottle opener, but it's a, got a new owner now because I have a new owner now. And what I used to use to get drunk with, like popping tops for everybody, it's still in our silverware drawer, but now I'm using that thing for like Topo Chico's, Fanta's, and O'Doul's at the max. I thought more people would know what O'Doul's was. <laughs> it means something to me. <laughs> but there's a new owner over that tool. And because there's a new owner, it's now being used for good. This is what the scripture says here in verse one of chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. It's like when you were unbelievers, you didn't have God, you were led astray. There's no neutral in the spiritual life. You're either following God or you're following sin and Satan. He's like, you were led astray because of your old ownership, the old manager, you were led astray to mute idols. And we know from a previous chapter that an idol is nothing but what is behind an idol is a demon. And so he's like, the, the idols don't talk, they were mute, you were led astray as you were a pagan, but it doesn't end there. However you were led, therefore, now there's the change and a turn. I want you to understand that no one's speaking in the spirit of God. So you had mute idols. You had mute idols. Now you have a speaking God by the Holy Spirit. No one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So what's going on here is Paul's like, hey, you've trusted in Jesus, Corinthians. The Holy Spirit has descended upon you. He has given you gifts. He's not a mute God. He's a speaking God. He's an acting God, and he's a living God. And so he's given gifts of tongues, prophecies, wisdom, knowledge, healing, miracles, help, administration, leadership, serving. He's given all these gifts, and y'all are like, whoa, what got into you, Bob? You act different than you used to act. And Lisa, What's with the new thing? Like you never had that skill or trait before, but it's because the spirit now is in them and leading them and speaking through them. And so Paul's like, hey, the litmus test is nobody's gonna say Jesus is accursed, which is what the pagans would have said. Like you're worshiping Jesus and no one will say Jesus is Lord except by the spirit. He's saying you got different roles on the team. Everybody's got a different position, but you're all wearing the same uniform. It's all the same spirit. You have a new owner new management, different and unique gifts, but all the same uniform. So new owner, but also that new owner has given you, church, new tools with new power. New tools with new power. It says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow from a couple weeks from now when we get to 1 Corinthians 14, six times in 1 Corinthians 14, it speaks about a gift 
And the gift, as he says, is for the upbuilding of the church. Six times the words upbuilding or built up. That this gift, its purpose is to build up the church. And then in Ephesians 4.12, where it says, he lists off some spiritual gifts and, and offices of spiritual authority with apostles, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And he says, these are to equip the body for good works, to equip the saints for good works, for the ministry. And then he says, so that, the purpose, so that the body of Christ may be built up. That it's all for the building of the church, the body of Christ, these tools that we've been given. And so spiritual gifts are like tools in a toolkit. Like if you had a toolbox with all a variety of tools, that's what the spiritual gifts are, and the sole purpose is for the building up of the church. Here it is in verse four. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God. There you have a Trinitarian passage where he's like, Spirit, Lord Jesus, God the Father, Trinity, all working together in unison for the body. He says, who empowers them in all? You see, these, these new tools, they're not power tools. They're tools that have a power of the Holy Spirit that as we yield ourselves, surrender, submit, in glad submission to the Lord, he then gives us the power to use the gift for the body. Verse seven, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. It says to each. It, it doesn't say to some. Sometimes we think like, well, I know that that person's clearly got a gifting, but I, I really don't. It says to each. Every single person who's placed their faith in Jesus has been given a gift by the Spirit. It says for the common good. The gift that you've been given is for the building up of the body. You've been given a gift for the common good of all. Not to edify yourself, but to edify others. Verse eight, for to one, and I was gonna give you a laundry list of gifts. For to one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. That's evil and, and holy. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. You know, throughout that passage, there's nine verses. He says nine times in nine verses, spirit, the same spirit, spirit, according to the same spirit, the spirit who empowers them all. The refrain is, it's all the spirit. You have a new owner and the power of the gift or the tool is all coming from the spirit. And it says to each one individually as he wills. Now, I told you before that I, I went to this like prosperity gospel church. I was like three months sober, baby believer. I'm walking in this church. They're asking people for seed money, all that stuff. And at the end of the service, they're like, and if anybody wants to have a closer relationship with God, come forward. Well, I was like, well, of course, like I'm going forward. I go forward and they're like, have you received the gift of speaking in tongues? And I was like, no. And they're like, well, you can have a closer relationship with God. You'll have your own unique language and this and that. Would you want to receive it? And, and they're like, just pray. And they're like, try harder. Try harder. Just keep practicing. And I walked out of that church without the ability to speak in tongues and with a crushing weight that I didn't have enough faith or God didn't love me enough and that I was a subpar JV Christian because I didn't have that gift. Now as far as I can tell, when you're reading this scripture, it says, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Not as I will, but as the Spirit wills. That he's the one that gives gifts and I don't dictate to him, I'd like this one, this one, and this one. That he wills to give the gifts. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. He's now giving an analogy of a physical body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. There it is again, just nine times, Holy Spirit empowered for the common good, apportioned as the Spirit wills. Now, if as I read through that, you're thinking like, man, I didn't, 
I didn't like hear my gift. Like as I read, as I hear that with like knowledge and wisdom and tongues, interpretation, prophecy, I, I don't think my spiritual gifts was listed there. That's not an exhaustive list of spiritual gifts. So this is 1 Corinthians 12. You'll, this is easy to remember. In Romans 12, you will also find a list of spiritual gifts. In Ephesians 4 and in 1 Peter 4, there's four passages where you'll find spiritual gifts there that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, I've said built a lot, so let's get to building. I've got uh, some stuff on stage here. I've got some scraps of wood. Uh, this is my grandfather's toolbox. I've got a saw. And um, just to show you in case you're like, is that really your grandfather's toolbox or is this just part of the sermon illustration? Look at that. I mean, I, I don't know what a county collector does or is. If you are one, congratulations, you got elected. My grandfather, I pulled this out and he had these bumper stickers in there. I'm like, okay, cool, county collector. Let's see what we got. But um, he used this tools. He was a World War II military guy. He could build anything out of anything. And so uh, we would go to his house. He would have like plywood and wires and he would build a radio where he could talk to somebody in Australia. I mean, it was wild. And so I, I have his tools and some of them I know what to do, and some of them I don't want to do. I don't know what to do with them. But I, I gave some tools to some people here in the front, and uh, I'd like to ask you for them. So, sir, if you would, um, hand, me the, hand me the tools below your seat, because I, I need to build some stuff. All right, so he's got a carpentry pencil, and this is an angle finder. That's cool. I need something else. What do you got? I gave you some stuff. Got my grandfather's tape measure and a rasp or a file. But I can't. I can't build with just those. I, I need more gifts, and so I've got some other stuff over here. I don't know if you guys have looked underneath there yet. Cool, thank you. Got some nails and a hammer. And I'm gonna use these to build something. Now, the reason why I gave them to them is because it's what God did with us. It says he has given the gifts or the tools to the body. They're, they're in our possession, but he is the one who empowers them. And so if I'm going to build something like God says he's going to, as he's going to build up um, the body of Christ, the household of God, to build up the church, then we got to use the tools, the tools that he has given individually to each one of us. But he is the one who empowers them. And so I know that um, what I'm building here, this is, this is a five-foot spread across the base here. And I've got a six-foot two-by-four. Um, two-by-fours, because of shrinkflation, are no actually, they're not actually two-by-four. They're like one and change by three and change. But I know I need to take 12 inches off. Some of you are like, what is shrinkflation? You're going to find out. Uh, this measuring tape, like you think about that, like, well, well what, could, what could that be in relationship to spiritual gifts? Here's what I would tell you. This, this lays forth knowledge. Like, I need to take 12 inches off of that, but I don't know where the 12 inches is. 12 inches are. You're like, you need grammar lessons. Uh, and so I've got to measure out, and that could be called the gift of knowledge. And in my Bible, no joke, right there, with a line drawn, before he was our elder or lead pastor, there was a line drawn from the gift of knowledge that said, Blake Holmes. Because I saw it in him. He just like knows the Lord, knows the word, knows how to apply it, the gift of knowledge. But I need to mark that. Like once the knowledge is laid forth, I need to know how to communicate it. And so I've got a pencil here. And the pencil could represent the gift of teaching. The gift of teaching. Um, so that we know what the knowledge laid forth. And for that, I'll draw a line, and I think that represents T.A. He's got the gift of teaching. To lay forth the scriptures of God and say, this is what the Lord says. And then I've got that angle finder. So once the knowledge has laid it out, and I've got this angle finder, I would call that the gift of wisdom. And when I, because wisdom is like to take that and apply it to the board, to apply it to life. And as I think about that, I think about our elder Kyle Thompson who has just got an incredible amount of wisdom. Wisdom in the Hebrew is chokmah. It is knowledge, skilled living. Like taking knowledge and applying it to your life so that it's lived out. So now I know like, oh, that's, that's how I'm gonna apply that to what I need to do. You're taking that gift of wisdom and applying it. And again, it's not so that Kyle Thompson can be wise and everybody be like, he's so wise. He's using that as a gift 
for the body of Christ that we can be shepherded and led as one of our elders. Now, there's also, uh, I need to cut this. Like, now that I've made the line and I've got it there, I've got I've to cut that. And I thought about the saw, and I'm like, oh, the saw is faith. Like, like the saw, like, because I see it there, but I've got some serious resistance with that wood, and I'm not going to be able to get through it. And so I think that the saw can represent faith, where it's like seeing what could be rather than what is. And when I thought about faith, I thought about my sister, Callie Nixon. And if you know Callie, you know that that sister believes in a really big God who moves mountains. And so she will will rally us and talk about her God and the miracles he does. And as a result, as she's speaking, you're able to cut through the resistance of life. And whatever struggle or you're facing, when you have someone who has the gift of faith, you know that if there's an obstacle in the way, that with the gift of faith, you can be emboldened to believe that with God, you can get through the gift of faith. But then what you've got here on the end, and you can see that, there's, I mean, you're going to get splinters. There's, there's, it didn't make a clean cut. And so you need a rasp or a file. And what I think this is, is the gift of mercy. The gift of mercy that can take whatever cuts you have in life, whatever rough places, whatever sharpness because of past, regret, remorse, those deep cuts into your soul, the struggles, and the person with the gift of mercy can apply that to the cuts that you have experienced and smooth it out so that it doesn't have any more harm is that mercy covers the cuts that have been given. When I think about my brother who has the gift of mercy, it's Leonard Bagdanoff, one of our community directors, who is so full of the gift of mercy and how he approaches people that have, that have struggled. But now I've got I've to get this thing on here. Like I've got my five-foot board, but I've got to attach it and get it on to whatever it is that I'm building. And so I think about... Um, I think about these nails. And the nails are a gift of service. You know, nobody looks at a building and they're like, whew, nice nails. Wow. And yet, the nails brought it all together. That's how they're stuck together. And I think about that being the gift of service. And you know who brought all this together? I've been out of town. And I'm emailing our teaching pastor coordinator, Lois Wilkie, and I'm saying, hey, I need like 12 two-by-fours. She's like, what's a two-by-four? She literally in the, <laughs> in the text is like, what does that singular quotation mark mean? Does that mean feet? And I'm like, yes, I need six-foot two-by-fours. I need an angle finder. I need a rasp. And she's like, she's on it. You'll never see her. You know, she's just working behind the scenes like these nails, but holding it all together because she has the gift of service. Now, I know because I was up here building this thing yesterday that if I just try to nail this in, the nail's going to bend. I don't know what kind of like poor nails we have here, but, or maybe it's user error. But if I try to nail those in, they're, they're not going to go well. But my grandfather in his toolbox had this. And you're like, is that an ancient syringe? That's horrible. <laughs> That's how they used to do it pre COVID? Uh, this is a hand drill because I could have brought out my, my cordless drill gun and put a hole in this, but then it would have the power. The analogy is that God has the power, that the gift that he has given is empowered by the spirit. The spirit is the one that makes the tool or the gift work. And so I've got to put a, a hole into this so that I can get the nail through And so I think about this drill, and some of you are like getting on Amazon right now. You're like, I didn't know that existed. Oh my goodness. (laughs) I didn't know it existed either. But that drill, you know what I would say that's the spiritual gift of? Is help. You know, some of the gifts we don't talk about, we're like, oh yeah, teaching and preaching and shepherding and mercy and generosity. Those are are like the marquee, yeah, those gifts. And there's none of that in the word of God. Uh, like further elevation 
It's Christ who's exalted. But one of the gifts that nobody ever talks about, really, here in 1 Corinthians 12, it's the gift of help, helping. Helping is a gift. We don't highly regard it as, as like cultural in this world, but helping is a spiritual gift. And when I read that, I immediately thought of a person who came to my mind. There's somebody in our community group, and he's talking about just life, and he was like, you know the phone call that I love? We're like, what, what? you won the lottery? Like, what, do you, what phone call do you love? And he's like, when somebody needs something, I like the 911 calls. We're like, what? And he's like, yeah, I, I love it when my phone rings and somebody's like, hey, you gotta get over here, or I'm stuck on the side of the road, or my, my house, the pipe just burst. Like, I love those calls. And in reading this, I was like, it's Mike Frizzell. He has the gift of help. I don't think he's ever like put it to words, but that, that desire in him, like, yes, I got that call. I get to use the gift, the gift that God gave me. And then, uh, you know, nobody has to tell you what the hammer is. The hammer's prophecy, because it just hits. <laughs> it hits a little stronger than all the others. And you're like, you need a little more love in your prophetic speech. Let me get this other side nailed in here. But I think it's so important, as you can see, that I needed all those tools to put it together. I couldn't, like, like I couldn't have just put it together with a saw. I would have done one step, but I couldn't have put it together. I needed all the tools working in concert together. And these tools, like now that I've set them down, they're, they're, they're inanimate. Like they're not doing much. But when they're empowered by me with my design, my, like I know what I'm building, y'all don't yet, but I know what I'm building. And so if those tools will yield themselves to me and I can put the power into them with my design, I'm gonna build something amazing. And it's what God has done with each one of you. So I told you about my son's uh, pocket knife. He buys it. We're there, and he's got his little electronic game that he's playing, but the thing's like kind of breaking. And I was like, hey, let me see that. And I take it apart a little bit. I was like, oh, we need like an electronics screwdriver, like the tiny ones. You know the t one I'm talking about? It's like that you never use except the one time you need it, like not a big screwdriver. And we have those laying around in the garage. And I was like, oh, Hill, give me your pocket knife. Do you have your pocket knife? And he's like, yeah, I got it right here. And I take it out because it's got this tiny, tiny tip and I'm able to just like turn these little bitty screws. And I think that's how a lot of us are. I think sometimes we have the gift. We've been given the gift by God. And sometimes we don't even know it. We're walking around and the body of Christ is like, man, we could really use help right now or serving right now or leadership or whatever it may be. And you've got it like you've been given it. You just don't know yet that the Spirit's given that to you. And so two things I wanna point you to. One is to watermark.org slash serve. We're gonna have in the sermon notes. You don't have to even, even write it down, but it's, it's all the serving opportunities here at Watermark, and there's an abundance. And sometimes you're like, but I don't even know what my gift is. Like, I, I would just show up. That's perfect. That's how you're gonna find out what your gift is. Because you go to an area of passion, a ministry, maybe it's kids ministry here or at the five o'clock if you want to serve there, but all the different opportunities. And as you do, you're going to feel alive when you're doing that thing. And then the body of Christ is going to be like, dude, when you like your hospitality gift is off the charts, like nobody even asks you, we show up and you've got like tablecloths, napkins, unlike Dairy Queen, you've, you've got drinks. You're just like, your hospitality is crazy. Like every time I come over to your house or your gift of help or serving, like you come alive. You're just like, hey, what can I help you do? I don't, I don't wanna do anything else. I just, I'm here to help or to serve. And you come alive when you do that. Or maybe it's when you show up and things are kind of chaotic and we got a ton of volunteers and you're like, okay, hey, everybody, everybody, come in. Welcome. Hey, tonight's gonna be an incredible night. Who here wants to be a greeter? Awesome, okay, great, you guys go there. Hey, who here would love to man the information desk? Great, you're gonna be here. And that's the gift of leadership. But sometimes you don't know that you're literally carrying it because the Holy Spirit has given you because you haven't just stepped into that opportunity. Like my son had it in his pocket. I'm like, you have that tool, but I need to use it because I'm gonna use it for good and for building up. 
So we have new owner, new tools with new power, and then we've got this new vibe. And this new vibe is one of, of love. It's one of missional living. It, this new vibe is not self-degradation or self-exaltation, but that we're living for Christ and we're unified under the headship of Christ. Because again, we're talking about spiritual gifts and everybody's got a different one. And so you're gonna see in the scripture one part where it's like, well, I'm not much because I'm this. And another one's like, well, I don't need you because I'm this. And Paul's like, that's nonsense. You're all parts of the body and you're all under Christ, all for the building up of the body. It says in verse 14, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm just a foot, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And then it says in verse 21, so there's self-degradation, here's self-exaltation. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Like with a saw, I can use the saw to build a house. It's helpful. In fact, I can't build a house without a saw. But if I just have a saw, I can't build the house. And so there's self-degradation. We're like, well, I'm just a saw. It's like, no, you're essential. Like what God has given to you is an essential part of the body to build it up. And if you're like, well, I'm a saw, I'll build the whole thing. It's like, well, it's gonna be a wreck then because you need all of those pieces working together. There's no self-degradation and no self-exaltation. Instead, it's every part working together. Samuel Brengel, who was early one of the officers within the Salvation Army, he said this, which I think is so applicable to this passage on gifts. He says, if I appear great in their eyes, the ones he was serving, the Lord is most graciously helping me to see how absolutely nothing I am without him and helping me to keep little in my own eyes. He does use me, but I am so concerned that he uses me, that he uses me, and that it is not me that the work is done. The ax cannot boast of the tree is cut down. It could do nothing but for the woodsman. He made it, he sharpened it, and he used it. And the moment he throws it aside, it becomes only old iron. Oh, that I may never lose sight of this. Samuel Brengel was saying like, hey, I am only as useful as me yielding myself to the master, allowing him to empower me for the work that I was designed to do. It's not me. And once he lays me down, like that's it. But that my life is given over to him and that I would not receive glory, but that he would get all of the glory. It says something similar in scripture in Isaiah 10, 15. So, the Lord uses countries. He'll raise them up and lower them down. He'll use them as his tools over the whole entire earth. And at this point in time, when Isaiah was being written, he had been using Assyria uh, to rule the world and to create discipline. But Assyria, rather than being like, man, the Lord is being kind to us right now. He's using us. Instead, they're like, we're the best. We're awesome. Look at us. And so this is what he had to say to Assyria who self-exalted. Does the ax raise itself above the person who swings it? Or the saw boast against the one who uses it? It's like the ax can't raise itself. The hammer can't raise itself. It's only the person using it who gets all of the glory. Verse 25, here's more of the new vibe. So it's not self-degradation. It's not self-exaltation. Here's more of the new vibe, which is unity. Verse 25, that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So whether suffering or honoring, every part is with the others that there would be no division. We're marked by unity under Christ. In John 17, he prays, like the great priestly prayer, he prays, I pray that they would be one as you and I, the Father, are one. He's calling for unity, that they would, we wouldn't strive or quarrel or be jealous or envious of giftings or anything else in life, that in, with suffering, it would be met with compassion and help and kindness and sympathy. And that when there's someone is honored with a new job or a pregnancy or whatever it would be, that we would rejoice rather than being envious. You know, right across the road here, 
literally across the road, Lake Point Church is opening one of their campuses, right there by In-N-Out. Do you know we rejoice in that? We rejoice in any time that the word of God and the salt and light of Christ is being placed throughout the city. They're gonna reach people in their sphere of influence that we aren't. Like, so we rejoice in that. There's no division there. Praise God that more people will be reached for Christ. Marked by compassion and celebration. And then in verse 27 it says, now you are the body of Christ, individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, there it is, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? The implied answer is no. It's a rhetorical question. Like you each have individual things, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. The beginning of that passage starts off with a genitive, which is a possessive term in grammar. It says the body of Christ. The body of Christ, meaning he is the one that possesses all of the tools of the body. He's the one that we are under his ownership and surrender to him because he's the head that's deciding this is what I'm building, this is what I'm doing. We belong to him the head of the body, the church. And it says that we don't have all the gifts. Like he's clear there, are are all teachers, are all prophets, are all apostles? And the answer's no, but he says, but eagerly desire the higher gifts. This means that as you're stewarding and exercising your gifts, he says that we can desire even more gifting. Like, Lord, I wanna be faithful with the little you've given me, but I wanna be faithful with more. And so would you entrust to me what you determine for your will for the building up of the body, not so that I could be greater and be like, wow, he's a really gifted dude. That would be sin. But instead, like, Lord, I long to serve more for your kingdom unending and that you can desire those. But then he goes further and he says, and I will show you a still more excellent way. That despite all the gifts that do all the building, he says there's something, there's something even better. And devotes an entire chapter to it in chapter 13. And he says it's love. I used to have this uh, European car back when, well, before. And uh, I just say that because it was, it was nice. It was a nice car. And I was, I was so ego driven then, status and all that. But that really nice car, it ran out of oil. And guess what? Boom. Highway, screeching halt, that thing was toast. $10,000 engine, done, because it didn't have oil. No matter how nice the tools, the machinery, no matter how incredibly German engineered it was, without oil, it was nothing. And it's exactly what Paul will write in just a couple more verses. He says, if you have tongues of men and angels, if you have the faith to move mountains, if you possess all knowledge and you don't have love, you're a nuisance. And that is still the more excellent way that we have got to keep ourselves under the headship of Christ, knowing that no matter what our gifting, if you lack love, you're annoying, you're a resounding gong. May we never be engines without oil of love, but that love would just be flowing through us as we work in concert together. We are transformed by Christ to love like Christ. Now, you gotta be wondering, like, what what are you building? Like, tell me you're not gonna forget that. And so let me me show you what, what I was building, what I worked on yesterday that I wanna now show to you, because I wasn't just building in vain. I had something in mind that I worked very hard on. And it's this, the church of Jesus Christ. And we all know that a church isn't a building, but I wanted to demonstrate to you what God does with the spiritual gifts and the tools. He's doing something. He's building up the body of Christ. And Christ, rightly so, is always at the top, receiving all the attention, all the glory, all the power, all the renown. And you gotta see something. Because as I was building this yesterday, whoa. (laughs) 
every other nail that I did, it went right in, just like the ones this morning. I got to the cross, I'm right over there, and hammering in the nail, and it kinks and goes sideways. And I try to pull it out, and it's jammed. And I'm like, I'm gonna have to get a grinder. I can't believe this. Lord, you know I need this cross to be there. And I go for another one. Tink, 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 and it kinks again. I try to straighten it. The more I hit it, the crookeder it gets. I drop in another one three times. And as I'm literally with my hammer trying to pull them out, I feel like the Lord said to me, leave the nails. That's where the mistakes belong. That's where all the mistakes belong. They've all been nailed to the cross. So I don't care what you've done wrong in your life, what your mistakes are, the litany of them, who you've been with, what you've done, what you stole, what you did, what you drank, what you smoked last night or this weekend or 10 years ago. It doesn't matter because if you're in Christ, all the mistakes have been nailed to the cross and they're no longer on you. They're on Jesus. It's why he came. The sinless son of God who laid down his life and took it back up again. As evidence, I took your mistakes. They're on me. It's why I came. Now use that gift you've been given to build up the church because others are trapped in their mistakes and they don't know yet So you make this place, build it up by my power and fill it with love that when they walk through those doors, their mistakes can be nailed there too, now and forevermore for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I remember so well the wretch that I was. And looking at those banged up nails and there were thousands because of my sin and thousands upon thousands more because of the sins of the people in this room and you took every one of them. The decree that stood opposed to us has been nailed to the cross. And as a result, having placed our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, we've been made new. We're under a new owner But you didn't just save us, you've sent us, you've given us gifts to now build up the very body of Christ. And with the gifts it would be built and the house would be filled with love that others would come and know you too and be set free. And so Lord, may we steward them. May we not keep our gift in our pocket, but may we steward the gift you've given us because we want to be found faithful. And so Lord, as we stand and sing, we sing to you with all our might, with all our voice, with all our soul, because you alone are worthy, Jesus. We stand.